Good day, my name is Mariette van der Hove. I work at the Amsterdam University Medical Center and I'm pleased uh, to share a presentation with you on research ethics and education, something in which I got experience recently, both in the medical and the non-medical field. Um, and I will start sharing my screen to give my presentation. So the outline of my talk is that I will shortly sketch the context of ethics review committees in the Netherlands first, both the medical and non-medical field, and I will also explain why I think that this uh, distinction is relevant. Then I will say something about ethics review and education, and I will make a distinction here between educational research and student research, and show you uh, accordingly some challenges in with respect to each of these types of research within the field of education. And in the end, I will come to some conclusions indicating what I think needs to be put on the agenda in the near future. When I talk about ethics review in the Netherlands, it's quite relevant to know that I'm only talking about research with human subjects, both the medical and non-medical research with human subjects, but all other types of ethics review are simply set aside for this presentation. If we look at ethics review on research um, of research with human subjects in the medical field, to start with, you see that it is organized uh, in a very particular way, that there is a national body, which is called the CCMO, that <clears throat> is kind of supervisory board for the medical ethics review committees that are uh, more locally organized, and these are often most, mostly part of university medical centers. And the fact that this CCMO is supervisory also shows in the fact that there is a legal foundation for this, this um, um, way of functioning in the Netherlands of these ethics review committees, but also that the CCMO will appoint all the members of these local committees. <clears throat> On contrast, um, we do have, of course, another field of research with human subjects that uh, belongs mainly to the non-medical field, uh, where all kinds of interviews, experiments, anthropological studies, uh, ethnographic studies um, are taking place within actually all kinds of disciplines uh, nowadays. And the main incentive to more recently, so compared to the um, um, MERCs that um, have been established all already a few decades ago, you nowadays and very recently, you see that there is an incentive of funding organizations like the European Union or um, Dutch funding organizations, but also in uh, more strict journal requirements that you have to show approval of an ethics committee if you have done research with human subjects. That's a, a main incentive actually for many universities and more specifically for faculties to establish their own um, uh, faculty ethics committees within their own faculty. And the interesting thing is here that there is a, a huge variety of uh, faculty uh, ethics review committees uh, and the deans of these of faculties often install these committees and have the final responsibility and final say about these committees. Um, all these committees function in very different ways, um, um, do check some main issues uh, um, um, similarly, but there is also a wide variety in the question whether they do check your methodology and your design or whether they um, um, will not say anything about that. <clears throat> so we have two different types of committees who are completely organized differently in the Netherlands. Um, if we now focus on research ethics and education, we can actually um, distinguish two types of research that is being conducted in the field of education. And I'm focusing here mainly on, on, on higher education, the fields in which uh, we are mostly working. Uh, first, there is what I call educational research, and where there you can see that teachers becoming researchers more often in an educational context. There is this international movement of what is known as SOTL, and SOTL stands for scholarship of teaching and learning and this means that teachers are increasingly challenged and stimulated to also look at a more research um, uh, research kind of perspective towards their courses towards the curriculum and do some research and publish on the results of their research within the context of their courses um, a second um, development that we see is that well we 
and that's not a new development actually, but that a lot of students in many disciplines uh, are also doing some research with human subjects and they uh, autonomously conduct research like you, uh, interviews or surveys or observations, either as part of their thesis project or as an internship or as a project that they do for a stakeholder. So there are all kinds of reasons why they conduct this research and the teacher is the supervisor who um, um, guides the students towards <clears throat> the end of the project and their thesis. <clears throat> well, if we first focus on the perspective of or, or the development of educational research where the teacher increasingly becomes a researcher, um, you can imagine, uh, for, as for an example, that you want to research how your students learn to cooperate in teams in your own courses. Um, and in the medical field, um, here you see a difference because in the medical field, because we already had these well-established CCMO and uh, medical ethics review committees, they uh, already a few years ago, they established a national ethics review committee for all the types of research that was involved in the field of education in the medical field. But in the non-medical field, it's quite arbitrary. If there is no faculty ethics committee, and there are still plenty of faculties in the Netherlands and, uh, and universities that are, have no ethics committee yet, then um, there, you, you're free to go and you can do whatever you like. But if there is an ethics committee, you might need to assess and uh, have your <clears throat> uh, plans reviewed before you can actually uh, start doing your research. Well, there are a few interesting challenges here in this development because it's an interesting change of perspective, you could say, this, this subtle view on your own teaching, to do more research on your own teaching. First of all, there is, of course, the unfamiliarity. So researchers um, or teachers as researchers are not used to um, have their um, studies assessed, so they often need a training and are simply not well informed about the requirements how to do such a research well. But what is more relevant is that there is a possibility of conflict of interest. So being a teacher and a researcher is a double interest and <clears throat> um, what could uh, and should be given priority, especially from the perspective of the students, because they can feel a kind of duress or there is no escape possible if, for example, you want to make observations um, on your students while the student is depending on you to get a grade and finish the course in time. Um, also, <clears throat> if you are um, used as a teacher to evaluate your courses quite thoroughly, what is the difference between ethics, uh, between ethics, between evaluating your courses and doing research on your courses? So the boundaries might blur a bit and um, the question then should become, uh, is everything that we evaluate in our courses in a very structured and systematic manner always necessary to evaluate and assess from an ethical perspective? Um, and also many of the teachers often think that the assessment of an ethics review is quite disproportional to the intervention that they actually suggest. <clears throat> well, you can see the challenges. Um, with regards to student research, there is a completely different kind of challenge. It is common practice in many faculties that students conduct interviews or surveys or make observations. But the main question here is, is an ethics review also necessary? Does a student also have to go through the procedure of an ethics review? And if so, why? Well, we can turn the question around and say, if we think that protecting participants is a moral obligation, and that's the main reason actually why many of these ethics review committees have been established, then <clears throat> the question seems a bit odd. And from the perspective that it shouldn't matter if a student conducts the research or a senior researcher conducts the research, it seems only obvious that all the student research will also be assessed. But here we enter a new kind of problem because students are still learning, there is a learning curve, and they are often limited to a very um, limited amount of time, 10 weeks, a few months. And um, if they have to go through uh, an ethics review, this is also taking time. So there we have a moral obligation against an educational moral obligation, and that is could be conflicting. There are no policies in this respect. And so everyone is struggling with this question, actually. Um, but there is a huge consequence, and this is challenging. If we say, yes, we should, in, in principle, always also review the student research, then it will lead to an overload of work for the faculty ethics committees, and it could become a day job. So this is a huge struggle for many. <clears throat> so two 
conclude and to see what needs to be put on the agenda, having sketched two different ways of new trends in, in education and research and things that are currently either not being assessed or are in the process of becoming reviewed by ethics committees, I think that we can come to the following conclusion. I think that teacher research and student research lead to new challenges that will benefit from two things mainly. First, aligning procedures and equality by working to more together. So unify all these faculty ethics committees within a university, but also preferably nationally and align it more in, um, <clears throat> in the way that medical research is also being assessed. Secondly, improve ethics and research by offering trainings for students and researchers on ethics review, especially in the non-medical field. It's something new, people are not used to writing information letters and they would be really helped if they would get a training somewhere along the line of their courses um, or if they um, are um, conducting research um, with human subjects for the first time in their life. Imagine someone from the natural sciences who has been mainly involved in computer sciences, for example, and then um, uh, never had any experiences with human subjects so far. It might be really helpful to improve their knowledge and skills by offering a training. At the same time, we also should be aware, so I said align procedures and quality, and I'm very much in favor of that, but we should keep an eye for methodological differences and proportionality of the ethics review. And this goes, I think, both for the teacher review and student review. And this is going to be a real challenge also. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to uh, any discussions and feedback that you have or experiences that you have in your own country. Thank you very much.